Hey there, thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then, let's do this. Seen a bunch of rundown new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the plow, and the five string melodies grooving. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep, beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the South are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, Please go to mybigfootsighting.com. My Bigfoot sighting happened in 2018, about two hours north of Toronto, Canada. To kind of give everyone a bit of a backstory, I'm like this, and this does have a part to play in the, in the story, is that uh, my ethnic background is half Native, like First Nations, what we say here in Canada for Native Americans. My mom is Native American and my father is Italian. This is important for this particular reason, because in 2018, uh, I'm a bit of an entrepreneur and, uh, you know, I was working on a business that was starting up and I was having a lot of difficulties getting it going. And in retrospect, it was, it was a very difficult tech orientated business. And I was getting really frustrated with just getting the traction going with that. So uh, I was asking my mom, is like, you know, is there any advice you can give me to help him? She suggested that I go take a visit, and this is in the city of Toronto. Uh, there was a health center that she recommended and also volunteered for. It's called Anishinaabe Health Foundation. And Anishinaabe is another way of saying Ojibwe, which is what my mother is and what I am also. So uh, it's a health center that in, is involved with just helping people in the community. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be Native, but it focuses primarily on helping Native people out with like, you know, health things, dental. They do all kinds of things. And they also do like uh, counseling, which could also be like spiritual advice. So I thought, OK, let's give it a shot. And uh, one of the things at the time I didn't have was my spirit name. I know my mother had hers. My younger brother got his. So I felt maybe this would be a good time to go do this. So I made an appointment and I went to go meet an elder. And when I talk about elder, I don't necessarily mean that they're old. It doesn't have to mean that they're an elderly person. It just means that they have a lot of wisdom and they're very insightful and very like spiritually gifted. So I went to go meet him and his helper and we had a naming ceremony. And uh, I was given the name Standing Wolf, which is uh, Nibawi Mayangan is how you say it. And after the fact, you know, it, it felt really good to get that. And, you know, I got to meet him and get to know him. And he's a really nice guy. And, you know, some time passed after that. And, I, you know, I was still having issues getting things going with the business side of things. So that was in the summer, probably like around June when I got the naming ceremony. But time did pass. And I would say it was at this point, September. And I figured, you know what, I'm going to go back to see him and maybe he can give me some advice on how to, if there's an energetic block that I'm facing or if there's some sort of thing that's just, you know, not necessarily uh, intellectual. If there's some sort of energy issue related thing that he could maybe help me move through or whatever it might be. Maybe he could be the person to help me with that because I really enjoyed the the ceremony process. And prior to that, you know, it was something that I never really was too involved with with like the native aspect of my heritage. You know, my mother was taken from a young age from her home, and it was a part of the thing called the 60s scoop. And this is not necessarily related to the story, but I just felt like I really want to reconnect with that. Prior to being in Toronto, I used to live in the country, and this also it does connect to the story further down the road. But I had a really, I spent years and years in the country, not far outside of Toronto, maybe an hour and a half. So I, I learned a lot about being in the woods and I was in the woods every single day. And, you know, I, maybe it's just because of just, I was just drawn to it. So I've always been really like uh, spiritually inclined myself. And, you know, I, I learned a lot of things about tracking and understanding the signs of the forests. And so I really had a high degree that I self-taught myself of really what to look for while I'm in the woods. So that being said, it was September and I felt like I should go and see the elder again. And I went to go see him and he, we did another ceremony. 
And this is kind of where the journey really begins with the Bigfoot aspect. But um, when he does a ceremony, and this to give people a better understanding from this side of the culture thing, what he has is a pipe that he makes himself. And there's a very specific reason. And it's, they're very specific shapes. And they all have a lot of relevance. So the, the whole native smoke in the pipe thing is a very specific thing that they do. And it's kind of like connecting to like spirit or creator or God or whatever, and to get answers. So he was I was asking questions, what could I do to help myself with this business thing or to do whatever I can do to make get momentum going. And so we had the ceremony and he finished and he says, you know what you're going to do, Ron? He says, you're going to go on a fast. We're having a fast this fall, like the, I think in the next month in October, he goes, I'm going to want you to go on the fast with us. He goes, you're going to be going for three days and you're going to be going for three nights. He goes, uh, you know, I don't have a, any doubts that you will be able to handle it physically, like to get through it. He goes, the only thing that I feel that's going to be very difficult for you is to get through it. Like he was just concerned. There's a part is very, in a way, kind of cryptic. He didn't really give me the full answer in a way that was like very clear and understandable. But he just alluded that he was concerned I wouldn't be able to handle a part of it. But that being said, I was very up for going and I was very excited about it. So he just gave me very clear instructions and that you were, this is where we're going to meet, which was, um, I guess it was, I don't mean, I've never been there before, but it was like a part of the place was, is a very large acreage. I don't know how big, but it was a part of it had like a campground attached to it. And that's where kind of like they rented for the ceremony. And then this is where everyone would meet up who's fasting. So, uh, in October, the time came. So I drove up there by myself and, um, uh, you know, my wife and my kids were at home and that I met the elder and he was there with his helpers. And there was maybe nine other people, eight to nine other people who were going to go on this fast. And uh, I was meeting him for the first time then. So it was kind of like midday. It's pretty early and they're still getting set up. They set up the sweat lodge, which is where the ceremony was going to happen. And then they, uh, you know, it got they had a big fire going and everyone got a chance to kind of have some small talk and meet. And so kind of later in the day, the ceremony started to begin where, uh, you know, I don't need to go into too much detail, but we all went into the sweat lodge and there's a specific, a very specific song in Anishinaabe that we sing. And to more or less summarize what it is, it's kind of like, I don't want to say summoning Bigfoot, but it's like you're you're calling for, and what we call Bigfoot is Gitchasabe. They're known as Sabes, and uh, you know they could be called many different things, but in in Ojibwe or Anishinaabe, they're they're referred to Sabes, and Gitchasabe means big person or big people. So we're all singing the song together about uh, asking Gitchasabe for help, or you know Bigfoot for help, for whatever our personal reasons are. And everyone's got their own kind of initiatives to why they're there. And I had mine. And uh, when the song's over, we're out, we're, he gets us. To, we're all in a circle inside and it's pitch dark and it's scalding hot because they bring in rocks that are sitting in a ceremonial fire. And for those who have done a sweat, you understand how intense it is. For those who have done a sauna, I mean, it's it's amplified by 10. The heat's just just tremendous. And uh, so this is all part of the, the ceremony to kind of get ready for it. So once that song and the ceremony and all the aspects are done and, you know, while we're actually singing the song, he's the elders are like, yes, get is here. He's with us. And prior to doing all this stuff, him and his helpers were there the day before and they, they left out an offering. I guess he went like spear fishing and caught a fish and left it in the forest for get And part of this is that if the offering is not accepted, no one will go out because it's not, it's, they're asking for protection from this being. So this is like a big thing. The protection part is a big, big part of this. So he, the offering was taken. So this is why the whole ceremony even happened. And so when the ceremony concluded, everyone was getting out and we're all obviously like dripping sweat and we get kind of cleaned up and ready. And you're already kind of getting pretty, uh, pretty exhausted because the sweat depletes you and the heat depletes you and you're just you're just drained more or less right off the bat but you know he he has he controls how long it is and you know he doesn't want to make everyone too drained because ultimately what the fast also includes is not just three days and three nights but it's no food or water for that time so 
is a pretty significant thing and you know it does take a lot out of you so as time goes you don't uh, time, we had to wait a while because uh, essentially what happens is that when it comes night and this is all done on a new moon so this is a big thing specifically why this elder wanted to do this because the new moon ceremony is much dip more difficult and obviously because it's it's super dark and, and i mean like real dark and other people, other elders choose to do it on a full moon, you know, to give people a bit of more comfort because you see a lot more. But he, this guy was very, tr very traditional. So he wanted to do everything as, as authentic as possible. And there's obviously things that he'll, he shared with me after the fact, which I'll obviously explain. But so the ceremony is over. It's starting to get dark. They have a fire going and the fire is very important because if the fire goes out for at any point in time and then him and his helpers are responsible for keeping this fire going at base camp 24 7 for the duration of everyone's fast until the last faster is done that's also very significant because it's it's like a protection fire and uh <laughs> i found it that night for sure there's stuff out there that you want to be protected from so uh, it's getting darker and darker and darker and he he basically waits until it's almost like 11 o'clock at night or 12 even i mean he says the later the better because that's when the spirits come out so eventually it got real dark and then they said okay it's it's time to head out so they it's like two different trucks that they had and you know the elder and a couple of his helpers there's two between two different trucks the nine fasters were driven out and he they, we get driven out super far into the woods like basically like they, they go for a long time they're like we were driving for like half an hour 45 minutes i mean it was a long long drive and then how he explained it to me was that each faster gets a very specific spot that he gets i guess a message to be told where they're going to be so one by one people were getting dropped off and they're setting up their whether they bring tents or not i mean the traditional way is to kind of bring a tarp essentially bring a tarp and a sleeping bag and the tarps is to protect yourself from rain or elements and the sleeping bags is to keep you warm but you're meant to necessarily go with like nothing and it's meant to kind of make you look inwards as much as possible some people didn't feel that comfortable i mean i just wanted to it as authentically as possible so i just had a tarp for what's called a lean to and for those who don't know what that is is just like essentially you're just kind of tying a tarp to a tree and you're leaning it in a way that the rain drips off but it got to my turn uh and they said okay ron this is your spot and uh, so i was with maybe four or five other helpers and the elder and he's walking walking we're walking like where the truck was parked i saw idling we walked i don't even know how far like um uh 50 yards into the woods or more i mean they didn't want to go so far where i where they wouldn't be able to find me again but they did mark the trees where my spot was but the, it was a far it was far in real far into the woods so it's pitch black or almost pitch black it's not quite pitch black but real dark and they're so they're helping me with flashlights get set up i put my stuff on the ground i, I tie my lean to and I just get prepared as possible and uh you know he just got, i got everything set up and i like, go okay. he's like okay ron are you ready i'm like yeah i guess i'm ready i'm ready he's like possibly can he goes okay well uh this is like good luck and he, he plopped down a big pile of tobacco on on the ground next to me and he said before he left he goes with this tobacco i'm going to be able to see like what how you're doing what you're doing i, I didn't understand quite frankly what he meant but it's kind of like he had his reasons and he understood what he was doing and you know I, I respected him and so there's a big pile of tobacco there and i also brought tobacco too because the, the what people should know is that tobacco is like a communication type of like medicine you use it to communicate with like whether if you're religious you're you're communicating with god or create whatever you want to communicate with but that's what it actually tobacco's for so that's why it's smoked and that's why you can hold it and kind of like say what you know that's what the prayers are you use the tobacco to make the prayer so i had some myself so they kind of leave and i see like you know i see them leaving and they get in the car and drive away and i'm seeing the car lights through the forest driving away and sure enough eventually it was just me and it was just me and a lean to and sleeping bag and it was just the sounds of nature and i was in the middle of nowhere like middle of nowhere it's middle of nowhere i, I can't describe it more if you guys want to just picture wilderness canada that's where you are middle of nowhere so i'm kind of just laying down in my sleeping bag and there's really not much else you can do the whole point is 
obviously the self reflect, but it's a big adjustment and you got to, it took a while to kind of even just get relaxed. Cause I was just so, just so alert to every sound and rightfully so. I mean, you're ultra vulnerable. You don't have anything to protect yourself. It's you're as vulnerable as you could possibly be. It's just, just say it that, I mean, there's, there's nothing between you and anything else. It's just, if there's a bear there, there's a bear there. If there's, wolves there there's wolves there i mean it, you're just vulnerable so that alone is what makes and intensifies the experience without question so i was kind of laying there and i was just listening very closely because you hear just stuff cracking and creaking everywhere and just every sound you're just like what is that what is that and you kind of you know i i started to somewhat relax a little bit and then you know i i just i don't know how much time passed maybe 45 minutes into it just like myself alone in the woods uh you know i kind of just told myself you know this is kind of why i'm here so let's kind of start with what i asked to do and i asked for help with you know resolving the energy behind maybe making this business going so i i took some tobacco in my hand and i was kind of just saying you know hey th this is why i'm here this is my intention and i just laid it on the ground and i was just kind of at that point the, the thing about i think with these things is that they're very spiritual beings and obviously this whole ceremony was in involves spirit like big time like it's about your inward spirit it's about spirit like in terms of outward spirit but i remember then i kind of had this feeling this uh you know my intuition was heightened with just being aware of what's around me but i just uh I just had this feeling that there was something really close by me. Now I couldn't necessarily hear anything creeping to me, but the feeling was there that something was like something was just near me. I I didn't know what, I, but something was near me. And uh, so I just basically was just lying down, and I was like, okay, well, I, I don't have anything else I could really do now. So let's just force myself to kind of fall asleep as best I can, even though I'm, I guess, without you know, for lack of better words, I'm I'm kind of scared. Because, like, you know, you're, like I said, you're ultra vulnerable and you're just in the middle of the wilderness and your mind starts racing and, you know, every sound makes you think that there's something there. And But this, the feeling I had was kind of more than just like something's there. It's like something actually, you know, I'm feeling a presence of something that's like, I, I don't know how to describe it, but anyways, uh, so I'm asleep and I wake up and I guess it must have been like dawn the next morning because it wasn't overly bright, but it was bright enough to kind of see through the forest. And I felt pretty good. I felt like, okay, that I don't feel so worried right now because I can see everything and nothing's, you know, there's nothing, no threat around me. So, uh, you know, I was just kind of just relaxing and just looking at everything and just paying close attention to what was coming to me, like whether it's birds or anything, because I was looking at everything as possibly something that could be a sign of something. And I was very like just aware of everything. And so more or less kind of spent the day kind of uh, just falling asleep from time to time and waking up and just again, looking around and I kind of, if anyone knows about smudging using sage and using a little seashell to burn the smudge, you know, it's like an energy kind of clearing thing. I did that a couple times. And one thing I did bring with me, which I wanted to do was, uh, I brought my mother's drum, her uh, hand drum that she was given. And, uh, it's like a, it's just like a traditional native hand drum. So later in the afternoon, I actually had that and I was kind of, I didn't even know, the the language of the words i was saying I, I i didn't really say anything in particular knowing what i was saying i was just kind of just started beating the drum and i was just kind of just putting out good energy of what i wanted and like kind of just maybe humming or something so i was kind of doing that for a little bit and uh i put that away and uh, just again throughout the day is more that second day after that first initial ceremony of being dropped off was more or less just kind of sleeping and just sitting up stretching and just being mindful of kind of it was kind of almost like a big meditation it was quite relaxing actually that was the gist of the day aside from feeling that presence in the evening the night before uh, there really wasn't much and then it was only <laughs> this is really kind of where everything really 
<laughs> goes real crazy. And I mean, real crazy. Cause, uh, so it was about, I don't know how to guess the time cause I didn't have a watch or a phone or anything like that with me, but I, I don't know. Let's, it's starting to somewhat get dark and, uh, not quite dark, but you know, the lights going, starting to get later afternoon and I heard someone coming and it was actually one of the helpers who was there the whole time helping the elder and he was there with the ceremony and that and uh he he came up to me and he's like hey ron how you doing this one because they come to, they do come to check on you from time to time just to make sure obviously that you're you're okay you're you're safe you're healthy you're not hurt or you know if you need to go home because whatever reason but the, he came to come check on me he's like hey ron how you doing i'm like yeah i'm okay he goes, okay, well, uh, we're just checking the weather, and uh, apparently the weather's saying that there's a bit, there's a big storm coming. So you get, I just want to let you know. I want you to get like just let, so you can get ready. And he goes, but uh, yes, yeah, letting you know this. This weather says there's a storm coming. So and it was starting to get more windy too. So he goes, okay, we'll just let you know. And uh, so he starts to leave again. I'm like, okay, uh, good thing I brought another tarp. So. Uh, like a nylon tarp so that I made extended my lean to a little bit longer. So it protected my legs a bit more because the, you know, the night before essentially how I was laying and this is also important too. how I was laying was with my head kind of closest to the taper of the tarp. So that as it gets higher and higher and higher, that's the direction where my legs would be facing. So I, at the very top where it's like the peak of the tarp, where it's kind of like, I, I just extended it a little bit longer so that it would just protect my feet and stuff from the rain and you know I wouldn't get too soaking wet but aside from that there really wasn't much else I added to you know my shelter aside from that extension so so I made that he left and the second night going into this I mean it was really I had a it seemed like a lot of things were starting to come to the surface with like reflecting <laughs> I was really reflecting a lot. I mean, off in the distance, I start to hear coyotes howling. And so I didn't feel as concerned as I would have the night before. But I still was concerned because a large pack of coyotes could do just massive damage to you. So I, I had no weapons or nothing. So it's just you hear that, you kind of go, oh, OK, they're they're out there and they're not that far. I mean, because if they can kill a deer, they could probably kill you, too. But anyways. Yeah, so I heard uh, coyotes in the distance, and uh, you know the sun was kind of now starting to set, and I could see it through the trees setting. And again, I was self-reflecting, and I was just thinking of what was really meaningful in my life, what really mattered at the time. And I was just thinking about my family, and my wife, and kids, and you know, just all the stuff that actually matters in life. And you know, I was just like being really grateful that what I have, and you know, I was just thinking of them. In all honesty, I was just thinking of my wife, my kids, and I was like, yeah, I'm. I'm just the clarity of what mattered at the at the time really was coming to the surface and i was really grateful for that i was like yeah it's it's really cool to have this you know i'm grateful to have this family and just all the stuff that i should be grateful for i am so that was kind of my feeling as i was watching the sunset and uh i i think i was just lying down i just felt so relaxed that i just fell asleep and it wasn't even night at that point and uh uh, but, but this is just uh, that was the last little bit of peace that I had because it was, this is where the craziness started. Yeah, <laughs> I remember I woke up and I woke up to the sound of the craziest thing ever. And uh, it was essentially this crazy howl in the woods. And it was already at this point super dark. And the best way I could describe it was waking up to hearing the sound of uh the werewolf from american werewolf in london howling with like a gigantic mixed with a gigantic bird squawking i mean i can't really articulate the sound and i don't know if i could find anything that would really be it again but all i can say is it sounded like something huge howling uh I don't know, 200 yards away from me in the forest. Uh, that sounded like a mix between the American werewolf and London howl and a gigantic bird squawking. And I just woke up immediately just thinking, what is that? And I, I that's when the fear really kicked in. I mean, fear beyond fear. Like I was like, <laughs> I was, you know, 
doing stuff in my pants, for lack of better words, not literally, but that's the expression. It was super intense. Just the sound was just, it was so intense. Like the, it was so loud and just how unique the sound was, was just, just insane. And I was just sitting there, laying there, and I kind of went late on my side, and I was just like, what in the heck was that? And I was just listening super close. I couldn't hear nothing. There was no sound, no nothing. I was just listening. And I don't even know how much time passed. It might have been a minute. It might have been 10 minutes. I have no clue. I was just like ultra, ultra alert. And then I hear it again. I hear the sound again. And now, now I'm super scared. I am mega mega terrified because this is not like i said i i mean this is my home turf like i not i'm not familiar with the forest but there's nothing that would have been there that i haven't been in anywhere else and i've never heard this before in my life it was super intense i mean it's just the craziest howl call in the woods and so i heard it now for a second time and i'm just like what the heck? what do i do i i don't even know what to do I can't even call for help. I, I have nothing. There's nothing, nothing I could do for anything. So I'm just laying there. I, I don't even know what to do. I'm just kind of laying there on the ground and I'm in my sleeping bag and uh, I'm kind of like almost in a fetal position. I'm laying on my side. I'm just, and then I hear it again. I hear this crazy howl. Like, I don't even know if it got closer or not. I, I think it did, but I was just, I wasn't at that point paying attention to the distance other than I knew it was close. I knew it was something I'd never, I never heard before. And in all honesty, if I kind of even think about it, even just laying on the ground, listening to it, it, it almost had like a height to it. It seemed tall. Like it just seemed tall. Like that's why I would say like a gigantic bird squawking, like mixed with a crazy werewolf howl. Like it was just, you could just almost hear the height to it. It just it's hard to describe. I mean, it was far away, but it just had something to it that you can like you could feel the height to it. And I just didn't know what to do. I was just laying there and I just I forced myself to fall asleep. I there's nothing I could have actually even done. I I, I didn't want to stay awake. I, so I forced myself to go unconscious, I guess. I, I don't even know how I did, but I did. And uh, and then this is where it got <laughs> way worse. Something woke me up because now I, I, could, I heard something about six to seven feet from where I was laying. I, something was there and I heard it kind of shuffling around. And uh, if you were to close your eyes I bet you could probably, if you're outside or inside, you could probably sense if someone were to come near you that they're not small. Or if a dog will walk close to you, you could kind of get a feeling of based on the way they sound and just, I don't know, there's something about the energy that was amplified about everything. I could tell that this thing wasn't small. And I could tell that it would seem like it was hunched over or on all fours. And it was... It was maybe seven feet from me, like, and, and because it wasn't pure dark, I mean, there was ambient light from like the stars and whatnot. I mean, there was enough light to kind of see what was happening. I could see something moving, like just there, like this large, large, dark shadow. And the pre the feeling of what this was, was just terror, pure terror. I was so, I was literally frozen with fear like literally frozen with fear where i couldn't move anything i was frozen with fear and then what made it even worse is i don't know how long it was there for but i heard it shuffling i heard it i could tell it was big and when i say big it i, I don't know why i could would feel that it was on all fours but it seemed like it was or if not all oh, on fours, like hunched over where it was like feet were touching and hands were touching the ground or something like that. But it seemed big. Like if I if I were to put a size to it on all fours, like I don't know, like five feet off the ground, big, hunched over, or something like that, like big, real big. And the there was no other sound other than the shuffling. And I knew something was there. And then it made this crazy moan sound, like a growl moan thing. Like it just it just <laughs> this is where terror became 
undescribable terror where it just made the sound like it went like the sustained moan growl i mean what happened after this there's a lot but i think the thing that i I took the most from this was uh, i mean this was happening this thing was moan growling at me like what i the sound i made i i think that's what how i best remember it whether or not it was exactly like that i don't know but it sounded something like that and i think it was just like provoked fear so much that i just remember seeing in my mind i, I just pictured my my wife and my kids and it's like i don't know how i'm gonna get home but i just know that i i see myself at home so i was just I just remember saying that to myself in my mind. It's like, I don't know how I'm going to be home, but I'm just going to be home. I'm going to get home. Because there's not that. Ultimately, how I could describe it was that what I felt was, and this is where it gets kind of weird in a way, was that I, once I said that in my head, I felt like tremendous peace come over me. And I felt like, it seemed like everything was going white, like, <laughs> uh, you know, not to sound hokey or anything, but everything I felt super peaceful and then everything transitioned to white. And then it was like, I just didn't feel anything. Af- I didn't feel any fear at all. Like, and this will make a lot of sense. And <laughs> shortly what happened, at least from two other people's point of view, my wife being one of them who was actually at home, but, um, so yeah, I just remember hearing this crazy moan growl and uh, me laying there in ultimate terror, uh, basically unable to move in my sleeping bag. And then just telling myself, I don't know how, but I'm I'm going to go home. I'm going to make it home. And then I just felt this peace come over me and like it just seemed like everything went white. And then I think I just went unconscious. I blacked out or something. I I went, I don't know, I, I just nothing else the white transition to nothingness and I, I was unconscious I guess but I don't know how long I was unconscious because I woke up and this is where it got even more crazy was that I woke up to what sounded like a war going on like a war zone like stuff smashing like just a war going on just something trees breaking like and I was surrounded by pretty big trees like some of them were as thick as like a, a a thigh or you know stuff smashing like total chaos was going on around me and i remember looking and because it wasn't you could still see ambient light i remember looking ahead of me and i saw something run by and it looked like some like something running on two like a like a bigfoot i would say like it looked it was a it looked like that i saw the shadow and i just heard chaos just a war going on i don't know what there was no screeching there was no nothing other than just just stop being destroyed and that happened i was i saw that the shadow of the thing run by me and i was just i was like i i can't take this and i passed out again and then i don't know how much time went on after that i how long i was unconscious for but then i woke up again and it was quiet and i remember just just i was like what what's going on like this is just so much to handle i can't i can't even take this literally like i'm i'm blacking out like it's just too much to handle too much to like emotionally spiritually mentally there's just physically it, it just shuts you down so i just remember waking up and then it, there was no sounds. There's nothing was going on. And I don't know how long it took me to even move, but I, I forced myself to kind of just get up a bit. I didn't like fully sit up, but I kind of like rested my sh- elbow on the ground and kind of propped myself up a little bit. And I was just kind of waiting. And I was like, I. it just took me, I don't even know how, I, I guess time was somewhat irrelevant because you don't know what time it is and how long time passes, but. I just remember waiting and, I, I, you know, I kind of got control of myself a little bit, my wits and stuff. And kind of like I did the first night, I, I kind of just was like, well, you know what? This is, <laughs> Ron, this is why you're here, man. Like, you you, you asked for this. Like, you, this is why you're here. You called this upon yourself. You're going to ask for help. You, and so I grabbed some tobacco and I was still kind of too scared to do much else. So I kind of just whispered in my hand, holding in, it's like, this is why I'm here. Um, you know, I just said what I needed to say, like, 
and then, then I reached out just as far as I can with my arm while still in my sleeping bag and lying down. And I just dropped the tobacco just an arm length away. I mean, it was an arm length away from my head and um, kind of more towards like more towards the, the taper of the lean to more closer to my head. So uh, I don't even think it even left, was far enough outside the lean to would even left like the barriers of like the protection of the lean to. But I just reached out and dropped it on the ground as far as my arm could reach. And <laughs> I was just laying there. And then all of a sudden I hear, I hear something come up and start sniffing the tobacco right by my head. I, I, you could hear it. You could hear something go <laughs> like smelling it. And I, I was just, I blacked out again. I just couldn't take it. It, I, it was just too much for me to handle. And uh, I passed out. I completely passed out because it was sniffing it right by my head. And I was just like, holy geez, like there's something right by my head. And it's smelling what I just dropped on the ground. So I, uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I passed out after all the war and the growl at me and all this stuff. It was just and going, you know, the white transition to peace thing and all of this all happened. And I don't know how long the transition of time was. I mean, it, but it, all of these things happen in that order. And then I just woke up in the next morning and nothing It was just, I felt total peace. Like I just saw, you know, some a woodpecker come and all these like little animals that are around me. And I was, I was like, Holy, <laughs> what the heck just happened? that was insane like it was just so intense I, I mean just to be able to see through the forest and have light and you you could see around you i was just like oh thank you like i was like wow that was just insane that was so intense and i was just kind of just sitting there just kind of just like what happened like i i just there's too much to process and thankfully you know after the fact i talked to the elder a number of times which i'll explain and uh, you know, we went into great detail about this, and I'm happy I did because because <laughs> it didn't stop with just this. But thankfully, that was essentially the the worst of the worst, and it was just it, totally insane. So uh, the morning kind of goes by. I'm resting. I'm not able to really fall asleep too much like the day before, and I'm kind of just like recovering. And it must have still been fairly like a 10-ish, 11 in the morning. It wasn't like first light at this point. It was like the, the day is well on its way. The elder came. I saw him coming with two of his helpers. He comes up, I see him walking. I'm like, okay, this is different. I'm like, what's going on? Because I know I had to, he told me I was going to be there for three days and three nights. So I was only on my second night or second day. So I see the elder coming and he comes up. I sit up. He's like, hey, Ron, how you doing? I'm like, oh, not too bad. He goes, uh, anything happen with you? And obviously he's saying this because he knows what happened and he told me what happened afterwards. And I mean, for the lack of better words, like I would just say that what he is is kind of like, he's like psychic. So I mean, to to describe it, frankly, he's like, in a way, like his, his gifts are so heightened and well-tuned that he's very psychic. So it's the best way to describe it. And, uh, you know, I've met people like that, too. But people that, uh, in particular him, he's very, very, very advanced in, in those gifts. But, yeah, so he's kind of... Kind of in a way kind of smirking say hey anything happened last night and like knowing already knowing what happened i was like oh you better believe it man he goes so i'm gonna let you know what happened like he kind of gave me a little bit he goes that was Gitchasabi. Gitchasabi came to see you he goes he was protecting you and uh he says i was the one beyond the forest so the Gitchasabi, they call him the one beyond the forest he goes he was there he came to see you he says he likes you he goes you're tall like him because I'm six foot four, and I'm not saying I'm that tall as a as a Bigfoot, but he, I guess, for whatever reason, he said that Gitchasabi liked me because I'm also a tall person. So I, I, I don't know why he, he said this, but he said it. He says, yeah, Gitchasabi likes you. He's tall like you. That's what he likes you. I'm like, okay. He goes, uh, so, he goes so I'm going to let you know right now. He goes, you're all done. You're all done. Uh, I was kind of confused because, like I said, I, he said I had three days and three nights. And I said that to him. I said, well, I, I thought I had three days and three nights. 
He goes, nope. I, he goes, spirit told me this morning that you're, you're all finished. You're all done. And he says, well, you know, you, you, you can stay if you like, if you want to, you can stay the extra night. He goes, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you choose to stay, you're going to be tested physically and you're going to be most importantly tested with your faith. <laughs> I, I, I was like, okay, I, I'm good. I, I'm, I'm ready to go. I mean, what happened before was just insane, and I, I couldn't imagine it getting physical. And, uh, you know, most importantly, if it's getting physical, why would my faith that I'm going to be okay be tested? And that, uh, I, I, was, I was okay with what happened. And obviously, it's just too much to handle. So uh, he told me that. He goes, yeah, you're going to pack up. We'll come get you shortly. And uh, so I guess he had other people to go talk to. But, uh, yeah, a while went by and, you know, I was kind of just packing up my stuff. And this is where I, this is where kind of was really hit home what happened, because, uh, like I said before, uh, like I spent years in the forest. I, I understand tracks, tracking these type of things. And, you know, I've, I've even tracked a black bear stalking me. And, you know, after the fact, I know what I'm looking at. So, I mean, when I was packing up, I saw the only there's only two tracks that I saw. One of them was the size of like a dinner plate, and it just looked like something that was like, like yeah, I guess running around the area where my lean-to was tied, and it just looked like a foot that was slid out in like some pine needles and stuff. And oh, that was another <laughs> that just reminded me. That's another thing that had happened uh, prior to. I I think I woke up again after the whole smell thing. Because I, I remember hearing like what sounded kind of like rain drizzling on the, the tarp above me, but it wasn't raining. It was pine, like these white pine needles that were being dropped on the tarp. And there wasn't white pine trees in the area. I mean, there was like old like oak and maple leaves and stuff like that. And there was cedar trees, but there wasn't white pine in the area. So that was really weird. And that's what I heard falling after. I, I remember that now. And because uh, I remember kind of waking up still afraid, and then I heard that stuff, and then it, you know, I just kind of curled in, in a fetus position and made myself go to bed. But I remember, anyways, so I saw the track. One thing, it looked like it was really, really big, like a dinner plate size thing that looked like it was slight, like stood, like slid out. If you're running like in loose leaves and you slide out a little bit, it looked like that. And that was maybe three or four feet from like where I was laying down. And it didn't really make sense because I had some ropes that were kind of tied to some, I don't know, like it was right on the edge of where the ropes would have been tied to a tree. So it, I, I was kind of confused at how that was even possible. And then when I was packing up, I got all my stuff packed up and I was kind of just waiting there for the guy. And, you know, I went to the washroom and was kind of just walking around on my bare feet, just kind of just like just absorbing the moment. And, and while I was doing that, I, I felt like something was watching me, too. But while I was packed up, when I came back to where my my stuff was, my gear was, so everything was packed up. There was that one dinner plate thing wiped out, that wipe out, like foot sliding out. And then when I was packed up, I was in there and I looked at the ground. I was like, what the heck? It's like, that can't be possible. And I saw a, a single footprint. And, and this was a footprint. This isn't just like a wipeout thing. This is a super clear footprint that was squashed an inch and a half into the ground and the footprint was i i went down and i felt it with my fingers i was like what in the heck and it was two feet from where my where my feet were laying so if you could picture me laying down like to my right if i was laying looking up this at the sky to my right would be where the saucer plate thing was the wipeout mark and then two to three feet Past where my feet were was where this one huge footprint was squashed into the ground and it had clearly defined toes it it doesn't look well at least this one didn't look like like a like a huge wide fat bigfoot track how i would best describe it looked basically like almost more or less human proportions like in terms of a huge a human foot for the better, more or less, just super huge. I'm a size 11 and a half. At, I was wearing a size 12 boot. It was almost, it was one and three quarters of my feet to like 
the stacks on top of each other. So it's almost two feet long, the track, and it'll squash an inch and a half into the ground. And so I was just looking, I was like, holy jeez, because I, I felt the toes, I felt the heel, I saw the whole thing. Like, it was just very clear. It, it was just, I couldn't believe it. And I was like, what? I just, I, it was just so crazy. It, it, just, it was so clear. And like I said, it didn't look like those weird, huge, wide, bigfoot tracks that you know, are very popular. But it just looked like a very normal, human proportion size shape foot just massive and squashed deep into the ground so i saw that and i was like holy wow like this is insane and so uh i was like okay well i know these guys are coming to get me now so i'm just gonna move my stuff to the like hike out to where i know the truck parked the first night that they dropped me off and just dropped my gear off there so it just makes it easier for everyone and I was really weak because obviously I didn't drink anything and I didn't eat anything and the sweat before going out, I was just felt so weak and even just carrying what would be normal, normal weighted things was just very difficult. And while I was sitting uh, on the road, I, I really felt like something behind me near the area where I was, there was two spots. I felt something was just watching. I couldn't, I just could not, not feel it. It just was, I felt it there and I just kept feeling it. And then, uh, you know, uh, I just kind of just was like ac accepting it. And there was other things that I've learned, you know, learned from all this stuff. But and uh, so, yeah, the, the, maybe at that point, once I was waiting for them with my gear on the side of the road, maybe an hour or not an hour, sorry, half hour, 45 minutes at the very most. They came to pick me up. I got in the truck and we drove back to where the original camp was with the uh, where the ceremony was. And the sweat lodge was still there and they had the fire still going. And there was a couple people that were still in the woods, but some people were taken out. And so we had a kind of like a closing ceremony. And, you know, the, uh, the elder was talking about stuff that, it, which makes it very obvious that he's psychic because he's saying the stuff that you were personally thinking and he's telling you, and you, you did this and, you know, you, you did you did very honorably you know all the stuff to talking about people and so we wrap up the ceremony in the sweat lodge and we get out and so they're making food and you don't want to eat <laughs> word to the wise you don't want to eat anything <laughs> right off the bat when you haven't eaten for three days so you, you know you just start with something like a little couple drinks of water sips of water and like some like unfrozen like thawed out strawberries or you know just something super light so they're cooking burgers because later on in the day they either they, they want to get you fed and get you back to being strong again and uh so i was kind of just talking to him and he's telling me all kinds of like interesting stuff that you know isn't necessarily related to the story but really would be very fascinating things to hear but i won't dive into that stuff but he was telling stories to everyone that around about like you know his elders and stuff that he was taught and you know just like a kind of another aspect of the world that is either like disregarded or forgotten or you know not you know talked about in a way where it's just superstitious or you know but he i believe it, it's all true and i experienced it but anyways uh it got to a point when it was maybe like two o'clock in the afternoon i, I just told him I, was like, I, I gotta go home i, I gotta leave I, I gotta go see my wife and uh so i got my stuff and he's like yeah go for it man you, you gotta do it and so I went home, I saw my wife, I told her everything that happened. She's like, you know what? And like, she told me, she goes, this is crazy. Like, cause uh, last night, like when it, all this stuff was going on, the, the growl and all the stuff, the, the war, she goes, I woke up in the middle of the night cause she was trying to put our daughter to bed. And she goes, I saw you standing in our, in front of our bed. Like you were, you were standing there and I didn't know what she even me meant. And she's like, uh, she's like yeah you're, you're you're standing there and I, I could feel how afraid you were and like i could feel that there was chaos going around you and i thought something was coming to take you like something wanted to take you and uh so that was really <laughs> intense having her tell me that because she's just obviously at her house two and a half hours away and well, how would she ever know this but you know obviously we we're very close and i love her a lot and with all my heart and i i think when i went everything went all white I, I think my spirit left my body and I literally like 
went home. Like literally, like that's the best way I could put it. I don't know how else to even define it. Cause she said, yeah, I saw you, you were there in front, like you're standing in front of like our kid's bed where she was trying to put her daughter to bed. And she's like, I saw you there. And I know there was chaos going around. Like I feel how scared you were. And like, it felt like something was going to take you away. And I was like, Whoa, Holy, that's intense. So like a couple of weeks went by and, you know, I was, I wasn't afraid of anything. In fact, after the whole ceremony ended, it felt like everything was super heightened. Like I, my connection with the forest was at like almost an all time high. Like everything I could hear everything. Like it was nothing to really, I didn't feel afraid. Like it was the weirdest thing. It was like, normally that would make you feel super scared, but I didn't. I felt like very, like just super and, charged up i don't know it was like the ultimate cleansing of energy i suppose and i guess that's really why i went i felt really good i didn't feel afraid i felt like yeah I, like i felt connected and so i uh a part of the all the after ceremony is that we all get to meet up after the fact maybe a couple weeks later and everyone who participated gets to tell what happened to them and and I told everyone what happened to me and no one had anything like this happen. None, none of them, like no, no one else had anything close to this. And I, I talked to the elder after the facts, I went to go see him like three or four times. And I'll talk about that too. What he told me, which is even more crazy. It's so, it's just incredible, but no one said no one had anything close to this, not even close. Man, everyone was just stunned with what I was saying and, you know, I and I said the best lesson I learned from this, and this could be something anyone can use or take from, is just the the power of like faith, like faith that everything will be okay. Because ultimately, that's how I would put it: was that if this being is a teacher, like it's just obvious, you're a Bigfoot, which I think I would consider being a teacher. It's like a guardian. It watches the forest, protects the forest. It's there for a reason, and it has very ancient knowledge. At least how I would see it now. It, it taught me something that was probably the best lesson of all. And that's like how powerful like people are when you believe in something and you have like unwavering faith. Because ultimately, you're, you, I was laying on the ground, but there's no protection. There's nothing. You're as vulnerable as a, you could be. You're beyond vulnerable. There's this, this massive thing growling at you that wants to keep like felt like wants to eat you. But it really felt like that, like terror beyond terror. And then all, all I had left after you whittled everything down to the core of what I was, the essence was that all I have left is just the faith I'll be okay. That's all that's left. If everything's gone at this point, I have nothing that can't be, you know, there's nothing I could do any in any way. All that's whittled down to the bare essence of what I am right now is just my faith that I'll be okay. And that's really where the strength lies is the faith of everything. Right. So that's the lesson I got from it. And, you know, just if anyone could use that aspect, if you really are in a position where you got to, the faith is the, is the ultimate weapon is the ultimate tool and it'll get through anything and nothing, everything yields to it. Nothing could hurt you. Like everything just bends to when you ultimately believe in, in that part of yourself. And that was what brought was brought to the surface so anyways that uh that the after fast happened we talked and while i was talking i was paying close attention to the elder and seeing his reaction and he definitely knew a lot more than what i was prepared to hear and i made an appointment to go see him again just him and i and obviously his helper and his helper you know whenever you go see him an elder they got a helper that uh, for this purpose, they just transcribe the meeting for the most part to give you notes to take home afterwards. But so I made an appointment to go see him again and I went to go see him and he's like, Hey, I, I was like, I got to talk about what happened. It's like, we didn't really get a chance. I didn't get a chance to know more about what happened. And obviously I want to learn about this. So he started talking to me about like, it just saw me, obviously Bigfoot. And he goes, yeah, it's another name for Bigfoot. It's what we call them. He goes, they're super ancient like super ancient. And if, you know, if I were to like recite some of the teachings that, you know, my mom has taught me and like, this is a, you know, very ancient teachings. Like it's said that there are seven very iterations of humans that's happened on earth. The Bigfoot were the fourth version and we are the seventh version. So I, I don't, I haven't dived too much in because in all honesty, there's not many elders that are around that I could 
really pick their brain. And this guy was one of them, but you know, I just spent the time wanting to understand what this experience was. And so anyways, he said, yeah, they're very ancient. And uh, in this particular case for you, what happened was this, he said that there was two spirits that came to see you. So he'll refer to like Bigfoot as a spirit. He'll refer to whatever as a lot of these things as spirits. Now, I don't know if it's necessary, like, spirit as you would describe as a ghost or however you would there's nothing i mean there was certainly physical they were physical so there wasn't like some translucent thing but how he worded it was spirit so he says there was two spirits that came that night he said the thing that was growling at you and um well i'll, I'll say it he, he he made a very clear point that you don't want to talk about these things and i'll say it for the sake of saying it he says that was a windigo he says that was what that was that wanted to take you. So they have they love the taste of blood, and that was there for you specifically. And I asked him, I was like, well, did it come for anyone else? He said, No, only you. And I asked him, I was like, Well, did Kitasabi come to for anyone else? He said, No, only you. And you know, it's left questions in my mind as to why. And obviously, you know, he he didn't some stuff he I don't think he will say because it's important for you to find out for yourself but he said that that that's what happened there was two spirits that came it was that thing um and he said it was it was the gitchasabi bigfoot and he said they, it protected you bigfoot or uh gitchasabi he was there to protect you and he's what chased that other thing out of the forest and that's what the war was and it makes that's exactly what it sounded like there was just chaos like beyond chaos like snapping like cracking i mean it was just crazy what the what was being broken and i saw it the next day just huge things that shouldn't have been broken were broken like it doesn't make sense how like they're just big powerful beings but whatever he said that yeah they came he protected you he said we call it the one beyond the forest for what reason i guess because maybe they're interdimensional i don't necessarily know and i'm only going off of just intuition what i feel it is but regardless he says yeah it was there to protect you and um so i was asking him more questions about it and he's just telling me more of what i need to personally do and you know i'll, I'll tell you in a second but he's saying he's, yeah this so he told me about his experience because he wanted me to understand this more he said when he was younger now he's not even old he's my age I'm, I'm 43 he's not even like an old guy and, and ironically it's actually kind of funny it's a small world it turned out he's actually like a second or third cousin of mine so that's even more ironic it's just it's such a small world so and i only found this out after, long after the fact but so he was telling me because i want to know more about this i want to understand why this why this like why this why that why did this happen why only me and there's certain things that you know I, I would love to share but i guess are more personal but i'll tell you what he told me he's told me that so he has been doing this for a long time fasts and he's done all kinds of fasts and i'll tell you the two very specific things that he told me that i'm sure there's many many more but these are the two ones that he wanted to share with me he said when he was younger he went to the province of manitoba and um uh, he said while he was there, he was with his elder, and they were on a fast, very similar to the one I went on. And he said that while he was on the fast, they set up a shelter, a makeshift shelter, kind of like what I did, but probably even more, like more primitive. He, he said they used just like very simple things. They made it themselves. And so anyways, his elder was there with a rattle, because sometimes you could rattle to bring like spirit in or whatever it is, but it attracts things. His elder was busy rattling and he was, I don't, he didn't really say how far he away he was, but I'm assuming he wasn't like necessarily right beside him. He was, and that's the thing I should mention too. Like when we're getting dropped off, we're, we're super far away from each other. Like you would never even hear someone else. So yeah, like you're very separated, very isolated. So I'm assuming he was the same too. I'm now that's just an assumption, but well, he says that he heard something coming and this was at night. And he heard something coming and he said that at the time he had i think like a, a deer antler or something like that that he brought with him as some sort of ceremonial reason but he had a deer antler with him i think it was like a, a, sh a piece of the antler so it was kind of more like made into like a point and he's told himself it's like okay well this 
if this thing comes any closer to me, I'm prepared to stab this thing to death or whatever he, he said to himself. He says, I'm prepared to fight. And he said he didn't come close to him, but his elder was like him. His elder was very spiritual and obviously understood what his intentions were. Because the next day he said he put the elder, because that was supposed to be the, the last night of their fast, but they got back to their camp and the elder said you're such an idiot so you think you're going to use that thing to kill spirits like you're you're such a fool he goes because you were such an arrogant fool i'm going to send you back out there for three more days and nights with nothing you get nothing uh, and i don't mean like no clothes on that but like you probably i don't think he even had like a sleeping bag he had nothing he had to sit there and that was the fast experience for him and he said that when he was laying down he said he heard something coming, and I don't know if he said he smelled something as well, but I know for sure he, he knew something was coming. And he said that it was a Bigfoot, a Gitchasabi, and it came, and it was an older one. He said it, he saw it. It had a gray beard. It was an older one. He said it looked at him, and it picked him up by his waist and put him on his back. And it began running with them through the forest. And he says he was running through the forest, holding on to his back, and he's just like, I don't want to say freaking out because he didn't say that to me. I imagine I would be, but he was saying he's whole, he was on this thing's back. It, it wanted him to carry him on his back and it was running through the forest. And he said, it was just, just tearing through the woods. And he heard other, and he looked over and he saw others running with them. And there, he said, they're hooting and hollering. Like he said, like the calls that I heard are calling to each other. And he says, you know what they were doing? He says, they were hunting, they were hunting. And he kept telling me that and he didn't say what they're hunting. And he didn't tell me how he got back. He didn't tell me anything. He just told me that part. So I have no idea what else, how that concluded, other than he was very serious about it. And he says, yeah, they took me in there. They're hunting. And uh, just the tone and everything was like, it was in, the way he said it, the intensity of the energy was, it was obvious. Like it, it was a pretty crazy experience. And he told me about another fact because he didn't. That was the end of that story. I'm sure there was more to it, but which he didn't go into detail for whatever reasons of his own. I said there was another time. He says I wanted to know everything about spirit because if he's going to be a, an elder and a helper, he says I want to know not just the good, because I wanted to know the bad too. And he said, Ron, don't ever do this. Don't ever do this. He goes, I asked to see the bad. He says, don't ever do this. He goes, it was the worst thing. But this ties in with the Bigfoot part. He says he was again fasting by himself and he felt something coming. And uh, was, I don't think he had anyone with him. He just went out. And he says, I, I felt something poke me in the back. And he says, it poked me real hard. And he goes, I got real scared. And he kept doing that and doing that again. He said he had a sleeping bag this time. He said, I just curled in my sleeping bag. And all of a sudden, it just grabbed his sleeping bag and pulled him right up into the air. And he was in it. And it just slammed, like dropped him on the ground. And he said he started running to the woods at night. Now, I, I don't know how he was seeing, but he, I'm assuming he knew how to do this. But. He he said he was running through the woods, and I don't. He didn't describe what was after him. He said it was it was bad, real bad. He said this thing was after him, and he felt super scared. And he stopped and he saw it running right at him. And he said all of a sudden he get just saw like Bigfoot came charging out of the woods. It grabbed the thing. Like he said there was some sort of quarrel, and he grabbed it and it ripped its head right off and threw the head into the forest. And he looked and he, he looked at me dead serious. He goes, Ron. Because we are protected in the forest. He goes, there's things out there that are there to protect us. And I was like, holy crap, man. Like, he, he he's like, yeah, it just, he just saw he came running out. And he said it ripped its head, whatever was after him, ripped its head right off its body. And uh, it just protected him. And that was the end of that discussion. And he told me a couple other things about, uh, you know, what they like to eat. Obviously, uh deer turkey wild rice i mean lots of things and he said these are these beings are what taught the anishinaabe about food and growing i mean he he said this is they taught us a lot of stuff too and about medicines and and he gave me instructions and you know <laughs> he told me i have an assignment because during the ceremony when i went for my fast what in the sweat lodge while all of the songs were happening 
uh, one of his helpers had a pipe of his, and the pipe was super long, about the size of like your arm. And I'm a tall guy, so I got long arms, but it's a gigantic pipe. It's not a normal size one, and it's called a Gitchasabi pipe, and it's meant to be like a pipe that's shared with Bigfoot, like Gitchasabi. So I'll say Bigfoot. Sorry, sorry if I keep saying that, but it's Bigfoot. But and it, it's the proportions that a big giant man would want to have the smoke with. So he says, Ron, you're going to make your own now. The next phase of what you need to do is you need to make your own. You're going to continue your relationship growing with, with Kichisabi. And the next part of it is that you're going to make your own pipe. Because I'm going to want you to get this particular type of stone. You're going to make it in this particular way. It's going to have this particular shape. And so I did that. I made the pipe and I still have it. And um, yeah, at that point, we were living in the city of Toronto. And we moved out in 2020 of the city, right when, you know, the COVID stuff was going on. So we moved out, we moved to the country, and we moved into a property that my father had that we we're staying at. And the property was on 150 acres. And it was an old ski hill, but it was like all grown in at this point. And it's a property that I was very familiar with because, uh, you know, while I lived in the country, I, I was there a lot. So we moved into that place, and this is where more crazy stuff happened. And uh, so I, I, I'm a bow hunter and I hunt with a recurve bow. So while we were there, in the beginning part of there, I don't, I don't know how much after the fact that this began, but you know, when I would go outside, because at the time we had a very elderly dog that I would have to take outside for a pee. And when we go outside, you know, you're, you're just basically stepping outside, and it's just 150 acres of wilderness and so it's real dark and it faces a hill, like the old ski hill. That's a part of this property. And at the very, you know, I would have to go out often and, uh, you know, you hear things at night. But one thing that we would start to hear was uh, I would hear something like maybe 300 yards up the hill into the forest to the right of where we, if we were to come out of the house, it's not, you know, to the right, way up on the hill, about 300 yards. I would hear the sound at night and it sounded like something smashing uh, a log, like some smashing something on a tree, like just cracking it, just cracking it as hard as it can, like just smashing it. And you would hear it be like whack and you hear it can go whack. And I would shine like a high power flashlight up the hill because it's not the hill. So at least sections of the hill and going and looking up this particular part of it wasn't forested. It was like starting to grow in with shrubs, but I could shine a light and hit the forest line where this sound was coming from. And I know that it happened multiple times and my wife and I was like, God, it's like, this is not cool. What is this? And so, you know, I would hear that from time to time and I would just get this bad feeling like nothing good was coming from, I don't know if this is not necessarily saying that that was particularly Bigfoot, but this was something because stuff started to happen too while we were at this property. And this could be unrelated to Bigfoot and obviously transitioned to something completely different. But uh, whatever was making it, I mean, I went, I would go up there because I would investigate because, like I said, I don't care about the woods. I love the woods and I, I just want to know. And there was nothing. I, I thought it could have been maybe like a tree that was hit by lightning that had a hanging log that was blowing in the wind but there was nothing there's nothing that would indicate anything possible was banging on anything it was just it was nothing uh, i didn't even see a tree that would even be like smashed there's just made no sense it was just this incredible cracking sound of something smashing a tree that gets hard like hard so yeah after living here at this place of my father's and hearing this the noise of the smashing of the tree thing um I mean, we were there for a number of months, not a year, but quite a while. And then uh, there was, <laughs> uh, I don't know how long after the banging thing, it wasn't overly long, but there was one night that I was, you know, we we're all sleeping and uh, I wasn't fully sleeping, but out of like, out, you know, if you were to hear someone like uh, call your name and you're kind of in the midst of waking up, you hear and, you know, it's that state of a uh, state of awake where it's like, just coming out of a sleep, I heard tapping on the window, like something was tapping on the window. And my wife heard it too, which was really weird. The thing about where the window was and the thing about this place is that 
uh, the windows were at least like 13 feet off the ground because we had to walk up a staircase to get to the entrance of the unit. And so there was just uh, windows in the front, which were all significantly high off the ground. So I heard the tapping and my wife says she heard it too. And I, I didn't even bother looking at the window because it was right there where our bed was. And I just, I just froze. I did not consider looking. I just didn't care to see if there was anything looking at me. I just lay back down and pretend I was sleeping. It wasn't that much longer after that. Like I mentioned earlier, I, I do hunting and stuff like that. But uh, some of the stuff I do with that is also I make particular products. So I was using like a lot of the the, uh, the terrain to actually do a photo shoot. So I was up on the hill and uh, I have, if anyone knows much about archery, I had like a back quiver, which is just a, a thing that holds arrows on your back with me and my bow. And I have the, my camera and stuff that I was going to take pictures with or the products I was. So I was walking up the hill and I was out there for a while and uh, I found a good spot and I was just kind of just perusing through the woods, which I was very familiar with the woods, the terrain and layout and everything like that. So I was about to stop to take pictures and I noticed that I must have dropped the arrows out of my back quiver bending over or something. Maybe I was, I think when I was tying my shoe, so I had to backtrack a significant way because I didn't want to lose them. So I just followed my tracks backwards and uh, I couldn't see anything. So I started walking back down towards like I was backtracking again the other way with thinking I maybe overlooked it and then it was really weird because it was like a partial I guess like a deer trail that would lead from the woods to more of a clearing and I saw them sitting there and they made a triangle they made it almost like an arrow pointing out of the woods uh, the way they were laid down they're positioned in a way which was clearly they're made to look like an arrow and it was really weird and i i was i had a feeling that i uh, there's just something around me so i i put the arrows in i started to walk down the hill more going back towards in the direction of where our house was or where the place we're staying was uh there was a spot that i felt oh because i didn't take the pictures yet so i stopped i took the pictures I was set up my camera, I set up the product and I was taking pictures and it was in a, it was in a, still in this opening area and the tree line was about maybe 40 to 50 yards away and while I was taking the pictures I I heard like a rock land right maybe 10 feet away from me. I heard it twice so I heard a rock land and I was like what because it's just nope not a possible um, not a possibility of a rock just coming out of out of nowhere and i looked and I looked straight and i couldn't see anything into the forest because it was kind of late summer so there was full foliage i was but i felt that there was something there and it felt almost like there was two things there like two things looking at me so i at this point i was kind of getting acquainted with what the elder was teaching me about these things so i kind of just like put out my arm and i just looked over there and i had like a good feeling and like in my heart I, I did just had good intentions and i just held up my hand and i kind of just waved just assuming if there was something they would see me waving and you know i might have looked like an idiot to someone who for whatever reason would have been there but i just figured i that's what i just felt i should do and so i did that and uh time passed we moved from there and where i'm currently living is about maybe a 45 minute drive we're still in the country it was last year i was maple tapping uh, i got into that while we were living at my father's property i was maple tapping and i was i think it was the end of the maple season and uh, i was in the maple bush in a spot maybe 10 minutes from my current location and all of this is happening say about an hour and a half east of the city of toronto so just to give people an idea of the general area the kawartha lakes area so i was I either had collected the sap from the buckets and I was kind of getting ready to wind down the season by taking the, the buckets and stuff off. I think I still left them there because I was just going to bring the sap I collected back home and boil it and, you know, make maple syrup and come back the next day to pick up the empty buckets and, and clean up. But while I was leaving the spot, I just had this this feeling that I should just stop. I just felt like something was watching me while I was in there. And then, again, this is like a middle of nowhere. There, there really wouldn't be anyone there and no one that I would be able to see because I made it a 
point to kind of go off the beaten track just in case someone would want to mess with my buckets or whatever the reason would be. Just I just felt like I set it up pretty out of the way. So I stopped maybe 10 feet from where the buckets were hung, hanging from the trees. And I, I just had this feeling something was looking at me. And uh, just one of the, like, I, I would have to say that, like, uh, I'm kind of like energy sensitive. I don't want to say I'm in any way like the elder, but it's just uh, just attuned to it. And I think a lot of people are, and they just don't understand what's going on. But what I did kind of like what I did with before, but the holding on my hand thing was that, I kind of held up my hand. I kind of started to rotate and scan to where I, where I would feel something. So I was kind of rotating 180 degrees and I ended up behind me to going towards where the buckets were pointing. And I stopped because that's where it felt like something was like wrong. And then when I stopped, I heard something take off in the woods. Like it acknowledged that I found it or something energy threw an energy way. So I just heard it just, and it sounded, uh, you know, I don't want to say, bipedal but it did it sounded like someone was literally running through the woods and big and crashing through it and that was maybe about 100 feet away so it was far enough away where i couldn't i couldn't see anything and i don't know how it would be able to see me but it i felt it i felt there was that was a location and the second i stopped and i felt it i heard something just take off running and ever since then i've just kind of been mindful of whatever's around me when i'm in the woods i always like give my respect when i go out there i I always just say hi to anything that's around me and say hey this is my intention this is why i'm here i always uh just communicate verbally when i'm there and just keep my guard up and you know not that i feel that they're bad the sasquatch or bigfoot or get i don't feel necessarily they're bad i feel that they are very highly attuned to what someone's intentions are and i feel that they have a guardian role and you know if there are bad experiences people that may have maybe they harbor or have harbored or did harbor at the point in time something negative and the reason why they had a bad experience is what these things were ushering them out of the woods and uh i'm just a big believer and you know there's a, a, a tremendous amount of things in the world that we're not told about probably for specific reasons to keep the knowledge level low but you know a lot of these old teachings from a lot of many if not all indigenous cultures around the world have stories and you know these stories aren't necessarily lies or wrong they, from my own experience everything seemed true so that's everything that's happened to me up to this point and those are my experiences well that's it for tonight's show if you've had a bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns Where the church is the backbone loves in the plow And the five-string melodies groove in With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah The sound of a memory brings me back To the bluegrass playing on my dad's a track His pick-up man had been through it Getting through the day on scrugs and skags Booking a bells to those Tennessee jams there's no other way that I'd do it When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Summit on the backwards, backwards and double time Looking at the soul and the drummer of Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming now Stop.
Sweet tea, got the sound. 